Welcome to Generation Impact Bible College. This is topic number 352 tonight. And the title for this particular topic is Leadership Qualities. We're going to do another topic on, on leadership and uh, just get a real real good understanding and a good grounding on what God wants us to be as leaders. Remember that when we spoke about leadership and defined it, it's to be able to influence people to be able to move from point A to point B or to do what they need to do to progress them, to move them forward from one place to another. So leadership is a, we see in scripture that Jesus' style of leadership is transformational in nature, but he has a servant's heart and so he conducts himself as a servant when he does that. So there's much about leadership that we've discussed already, and I hope you guys have enjoyed what's been said and spoken about so far. But tonight we're going to cover, uh, in topic number 352, we're going to co- cover a couple of qualities that can be expected within a leader. All right, so this is by no means an exhaustive list. It's by no means uh, fully, uh, it's not intended to be in any specific order or progression, um, but it's to show you some of the qualities that people have now, we also understand not everybody's got every quality, right? Because some are strong in certain areas, different personalities, different character, etc. And therefore, we different, right? And that we understand. But at the end of the day, these qualities, the more you have, the stronger you can expect yourself to operate as a leader. And the more you have, the more you'll be able to show grace and love and the fruits of the Spirit to the people that you are leading and that are under your influence. So before we carry on, before we go any further, let's just commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you tonight for this opportunity to once again come and to study your word, Lord. Father, we never take these opportunities lightly, nor do we take them for granted, Father. And we thank you, Father God, that even as this happens tonight, this word that goes out, Father God is anointed because you said your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts between bone and marrow, between thought and intent. And Father God, we thank you that even as this word goes forth tonight, that it will resonate with the hearts of your people. And Father God, it will take and settle down and be strong, grow in the hearts of the individual. So we give you all the glory on and praise for everything that will be accomplished tonight in this particular um, topic, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Hallelujah. Great for those that are still joining in. For those that do not know me, I'm Pastor Leslie Hessel, and uh, I am basically doing topic number 352 in this particular session. And the title for this particular topic is Leadership Qualities. Okay, we're mostly going to be doing um, another batch after this because I don't know how far we'll get tonight, but let's go for it and see how far we can get. So these are just qualities that we have identified in individuals that will help them to become more effective in their leadership and to show forth the personality and the, uh, and the character of Christ in their leadership styles. So in other words, when people look at them, they see Christ. Remember, as part of a godly leadership style, one of our, or in fact, the main objective of any go- a, a godly leader should be to bring people closer to Jesus and closer to God. And that means that whatever you do, doesn't matter who you're leading, where you're leading them, and how you're leading them, ultimately that is the goal. So yes, you might have a sub-goal to run a business or to run a ministry or to do whatever you're going to do. That's the sub-goal. The main goal is to make sure that the people that God has put under your care and under your leadership will ultimately make heaven their home and not hell. Right, so that is that is the that is the the bottom line of it. So so therefore, I just wanted to quickly um, just reiterate that and emphasize that, so that we understand where we're going with this. And uh, therefore, this these qualities is to make you more like Jesus and to bring you closer. So the first thing is unfriendly people. <laughs> okay, unfriendly person does not make a good leader. All right. Remember, Jesus himself. Okay, found time to go sit down with the tax collectors and with the Republicans and everybody else, sinners as they were put. And the religious leaders of the day still contested and fought with him about it, or them about it rather, and said, you know, this is not right because the Jews were taught to separate themselves. But Jesus went and, and, and spoke to these guys because remember now that the new dispensation, God made it possible for or reconciled not only, so it was Greek and Hebrew or Jew, and it was both sides. Gentiles were invited in 
um, through the gospel and what Jesus accomplished on the cross. That's why you and I are talking to each other tonight. <laughs> but otherwise, we will not be sitting here. So the thing is, because Jesus made that possible, and because Jesus drew us in, Jesus had to go sit down with the sinners and, the, and everybody else, and therefore he had to be friendly towards them and strike up conversations and share with them to be able to share the gospel with them. And it's the same with you and I. We have to be friendly. You cannot be a good leader. You cannot be a leader that's going to make a difference in this world if you're not a friendly person. All right. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2 says this, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. Quite a challenge. Because we don't know who's going to walk past our front door. We do not know who we're going to encounter on the road. We do not know who God is going to lead upon uh, across our path that we need to share a word with. And possibly you might be the instrument that closes the deal, so to speak, that brings a person into the kingdom of God and allows them to come. Because remember, there are many people don't think that everybody's going to set their foot into a church to get born again. That ain't going to happen. All right. And actually, when you can look at statistics, you'll see it's a very small percentage of people that come to know Christ that actually come to Christ through the church. I mean, a, a formal church, the building. All right. They come to the, to Christ through the church, but it's more through you and me, through individuals, because during the week, Monday to Saturday, there's more encounters with individuals once on, one on one, and more people actually come to know Christ that way than they actually do through a Sunday service. All right. That's what the statistic bears up. Then in Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, it says this, Be kindly affectionate to one another, with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. That shows you the attitude that we need to work with one another. Work with one another. So, without a shadow of a doubt, the scriptures encourage us that we need to be friendly with one another, we need to entertain one another, we need to be open to one another. You don't want to be offish. And I know in this world right now, we've got a challenge because, man, the trust levels have dropped in the last couple of years like you will not believe. Uh, maybe not all across the world, but in our nation for sure. All right. And the thing is that because of that, the trust levels have dropped. And the thing is that people are, don't feel safe out there anymore on the roads, at night, in the dark, in certain areas, geographically, etc., etc. People just do not feel safe. So it is difficult. To, to actually try to be friendly. Yeah, and look at the way the taxi drivers treat the, the, the other drivers on the road. And then suddenly we sit with a problem because I myself have had to, to, to check myself because, man, one of the people that can really press my buttons is our friends out there that drive these taxis. <laughs> and as, as a result, we have to really watch our, our salvation and really watch our, our testimony towards the people that are out there because that is how these things basically um, potentially can cause a problem. And so, therefore, we've got to be friendly. We've got to show Christ. We've got to have a Christ-like attitude towards the people and allow Christ to shine through us. So... One of the qualities then is to be friendly. Watch how you treat people. Keep a smile on your face. You know, be friendly towards them. Welcome them. Let them see something different in you. Leaders must also be responsible people. All right. You cannot just be a person that lives your life whichever way you want to. Okay. That ain't going to work. A godly leader needs to make sure that they have a, they show Responsibility. Now, the Bible is strong on this topic, okay, because the Bible calls us up on just about every area of life, okay, that we need to watch ourselves and be responsible. I've just chosen two just to give you a, a idea, but it speaks into lots of circumstances, families, um, business relationships, um, conduct with, with, with master slave. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. It talks about responsibility in, in your work. So the one scripture I pulled up was Galatians chapter 6 and verse 5. And it says, for each one shall be his own load. All right. It talks about being responsible for your own conduct. It talks about the fact that, listen, whatever God has created you to be and whatever God has given you as a task or responsibility on earth to be a steward of, you need to carry your load, okay? Do what needs to be done. Be responsible, all right, in the conduct and the way that you handle that which is for you to do. Don't just ignore it and neglect it and allow it to fall by the wayside. 
That's not clever. That's not good. We need to watch and see that we make sure that we bring our side, that we do what needs to be. So a godly leader will do that. They will bring their side. They'll walk the extra mile. They'll, they'll take their load, in other words. Then we also see in um, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23, it says this, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. So there you can see immediately in your work discipline and work ethic, have a strong work ethic, all right? Be responsible in your work. Do your job properly. Do it even better than what the what your superiors expect or want from you. Deliver on the on, on whatever they want to do and want you to do. And therefore make sure that because you're not doing it unto them, unto men, you're doing it unto God. All right. So keep that in mind. So therefore everything you're doing, even though it might be seem to be a manual a uh, menial task rather. Um, it's a menial task, it's something insignificant, it's something that's not important in your eyes. It is still being done unto God and you've got to do it well and do it in excellence and do it so that God can get the glory out of it. All right. So do everything as if you're doing it unto God, not actually do it unto God, all right? not as if. Do it unto God and that way you will become responsible and be responsible because you're accounting to God, you're, you're answering to God. At the end of the day. And as I say, your children, God has given you responsibilities about your kids, your, your family, your wife, every, everybody else, how you need to conduct and, and look after and, 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 and deal with that whole circumstance. And everything, I said, as I said to you, there's many, many areas that you and I need, and actually it's just about every single area where we need to be responsible. There's scriptures and his word on every single of it, how we need to conduct ourselves and how we need to live our life. So from a, from a leader's perspective, perspective, sorry, perspective then, he needs to make sure that he is responsible, that he's not just living whichever way, all right, a responsible person. Then I want you to have a look at Joshua chapter 1 and verse 6. It says, be strong and of good courage. For to the people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Now remember, it's the beginning of the book of Joshua. This is now where Joshua and Caleb are going to be leading the people into the promised land after they've been dwelling in the, in the, in the desert for 40 years. And he is now bringing up, and God is, now he is obviously, there, there must be some little bit of anxiousness there, and he's a young guy, and, you know, he's got to go in. So this, there's two things that the Lord says, be strong and be courageous, okay, and of good courage. So leaders must be courageous. They must be of good courage. They must be strong. Why? Because they are believing in God. They are carrying the conviction that they are being called by God. They're doing what the Father wants them. They, they're inspired by Him. And because of that, they're going to be courageous in what they do. They're not just going to run away and fall over and faint at every single thing that, that, that happens. They're going to stand up strong and be counted just like God expects from every single one of us, all right, to be able to stand up and to be put our faith and our confidence in Him that when we are weak, He is strong and that He will overcome on our behalf, that there is crooked path, He'll make it straight. If there is no way, He will make a way. And so God will, will provide and do what He needs to do to make sure that whatever needs to be accomplished is accomplished. You and I just need to be courageous. Faith walk is a risky walk. Let me tell you something. Because the thing is, we step out on water on a regular basis. Where we, we, we don't necessarily have the guarantees in the natural. We don't have the provision in the natural. We trust in God to bring that which is necessary and that He wants for that particular situation. So we trust Him. We believe in Him. Our confidence is in Him. And therefore, we need to be courageous in our faith and in our stance and in what we, we believe in God for. Then, if we look back at Korea, sorry, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23 again, the verse I just read just now. There's one little phrase there that I left out on purpose that I want to go back to right now. And if I just to remind you, it says, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Now, that portion, heartily, talks about passionate with things Doing things with with a, 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 a desire, a, you know, not 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 against your will, okay, not not begrudgingly or like you know, I don't want to do this. No, everything that a leader does, a godly leader does, 
he has to bring, he's got to be passionate about his, what, he's, what he's doing. He's got to be passionate about what he believes. He's got to be passionate about, about where he wants to take people. He's got to be passionate about the lifestyle and everything that he wants to do. So we need to do it heartily as unto the, God, unto the Lord. So the passion that we have to have inside of us to, to carry us through. So, so therefore we pursue God's stuff. When you start seeking God, you're seeking God with a passion. You knock with a passion, all right? You you go after God with a passion. And so everything you and I do, we do with a passion. So it gives you a reason to wake up in the morning. So you don't oversleep and don't neglect the things that are going on for the day. So we need to be passionate about every single thing that we do. And that passion needs to drive us forward every single day, all right? In, 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 in Scripture, there's another thought, there's another thing that talks about being hungry and thirsty, after the things of the Lord. There's a, there's, there's this desire that Lord, I need more than you, or of you rather. I want to experience more with you. I want to see more of you. Even Moses, when he was on the mountain receiving the, 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 the law from the Lord, he said, Lord, show me your glory. He wanted more. Because remember, you know, <laughs> if you think about Moses' story, that's quite an interesting one as well, because Moses already up until that point, man, he's seen the burning bush. He's on a mountain where there's fire and thunder and all kinds of other stuff going on. And, and he has already experienced so much of, of, of the, of God's supernatural working power, all the plagues in Egypt and, you know, turning all those things around. And I mean, you know, all the things that happened there and, I mean, the story just goes on. He has experienced and seen so much, yet he comes to God and he says to the Lord, he says, show me your glory. And I think to myself, Moses, you've seen so much already, my friend. What do you mean, show me your glory? So Moses knew that there was more than what he had already experienced and seen. And he wants that more. He wants to go deeper. He wants to go further. It's that passion, that desire, that drive, that God, I want to encounter you more. And, and you and I as leaders in the kingdom of God, we need to have that passion, not only about what we're doing and about things that are around about us and the natural, but also about God and our relationship with him and progressing in to him. So you have to have that passion inside of you. So Moses says, show me your glory. God then comes and he says to them, okay, fine. I'll show you my goodness. I know there's a lot of teaching that you know around that, but but my 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 takeaway from that whole thing is that even though he saw God's goodness and he saw the back of God, there was still more, and he still hadn't seen everything, and he's still pursuing for more because he knew that there is more, and so therefore the passion and the drive is there, and you and I have to have that same passion. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord. Okay. Delight means that I have to, I have to enjoy Him. Delight means happiness, contentment, satisfaction. So I have to delight myself in the Lord and I've got to find something in Him. All right. That will come and that will satisfy me. And you and I need to, need to push in to that and delight ourselves. So we've got to make a choice. Okay. That we love God and that we delight ourselves in Him and we like Him. All right. And we enjoy spending times with him. All right. So, so we need to do that. So there's a whole issue about pushing in and being passionate about the things of the Lord. There's 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. It reads as follows. It says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. So godly leaders need to be leaders and, uh, or people, men and women of God that are of faith. All right. Not people that are tossed to and fro by the winds of doctrine, things that are happening around about them, circumstances, situations. Believe me, there's a lot of that around. Okay, All you have to look at is the pandemic, COVID, how that rattled a lot of cages and hurt many and, 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 and really destroyed many of God's people and other people as well. So those things come. You've got no control over them. Look at currencies, rand dollar exchange rate. I mean, rand dollar exchange rate and, 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 you know, somebody just sneezes or says something silly. Um, and, and suddenly the rand falls or the dollar does something or the currencies go wild. And who carries the consequences? You and me. 
But we've got no control over that. We can't decide what the rand dollar is going to be tomorrow or not. Okay. So we don't have control over that. We can't do it. Look at the other one. Wars. Ukraine, Russia. I mean, the two of them decide to go at each other. And because they're going at each other, it impacts everything. Fuel prices, food prices, availability, um, transport costs went through the roof. I mean, shipping was like incredible. Um, and the thing is that prices just rocketed. Okay. Now, you do, do you think and do you believe that those prices are going to come down to normal? No. Once they're up there, they're going to most probably land up staying up there. Okay. So what we, what do we have to do? We have to be men and women of faith that trust God that our income will increase, be able to match the demand. Because God promises you and I, that he's never seen the righteous forsaken or the seed begging bread. So therefore, I don't care where the prices go to. If the price triples, then my income has to triple to match the price. Because otherwise, you know, prosperity is going to go out the back door somewhere. All right, because suddenly the expenses are going to exceed the income and suddenly the whole thing goes back to front. So no, God will provide, okay, and therefore, we need to make sure that He will provide for us. And we've got to be men and women of faith. We've got to stand unshakable on the Word of God, on the unshakable kingdom, an unshakable Word that cannot be moved. And that is where we have to be. And we have to stand on that and become unshakable in our own, in ourselves. So a leader of God has to show the character of faith. If you don't have the character of faith, then we've got a problem. Because believe me, we are going into a time right now as we run up to, to the return of Christ that things are not going to get much easier than they are right now. And the only way you're going to live a victorious life, an overcoming life, is faith in God. Because God has to go before you. His ministering spirits has to go with you and work with you. Because that is the only way it's going to happen. All right. So the thing is that we will overcome and we will walk in the victory that Christ has provided for us. But we have to do it in faith. Okay, We have to trust God that He will walk with us. So you might as well start practicing right now. You might as well start putting your faith out there and start believing God for the impossible. Okay. He says when things are impossible to us, excuse me, it's possible to Him. So you might as well start believing in the impossible and start trusting God to walk in love. So we need to see then 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight, not by what we see. Our circumstances, our situations, the things that are going around now, on around about us cannot influence what we believe. We have to be influenced only by one thing, and that's the Word of God. What the Word of God states is what we believe. We don't care what we see. What we see is, a, is, is subject to change. What we see can change. The Word of God cannot. All right. The Word of God will stay as it is forever. All right. Never change. But circumstances, situations will change. And therefore, we need to be men and women of faith that will stand on God's word and trust him. And that is a strong leader, showing a char characteristic of faith that you know what you see is what you get. All right, And he's not going to be shaken by what's going on around about him. And he's able to believe God and to pull it into his now and into his, so into his current situation. All right. So then in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 22, it says this, And whatever things you ask in prayer, believe you will receive. Okay, believe you will receive. That lines up with with <clears throat> with the, uh, the talking to the mountain, Mark twenty two. I'm oh, sorry, Mark. Um, oh, shucks, <laughs> the references have slipped my mind. Okay, but anyway, in the chapter and book of Mark, the talks about speaking to the mountains, verse 22, 23, 24, Mark eleven, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four. It says, "Have faith in God." And it says, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things will come to pass. It will happen. It will come to pass. If he believes that will come to pass, he will receive whatever he says. So your words, as you declare them, speak them into the circumstance and to the mountain, you have to be a person of faith because you go based on the word of God and the word of God in your mouth becomes a sharp sword as well. And you can talk and deal with circumstances, situations and see the turnaround and see the change and see God's hand move in your life. Then it says, carries on to say in verse, <coughs> sorry, in verse 24, it then says, when you stand praying, believe that you receive it and you shall have it. All right. So believe it will come to pass. 
believe that you receive what you say, and then believe that when you start praying, it will come in. All right. So you trust God and believe God. So therefore, you and I as leaders cannot be people that are wishy-washy in our faith. Because in the book of James, it tells us in no uncertain terms that <clears throat> we cannot be tossed to and fro by the by circumstances and by situations. And one, because the minute that doubt comes in, that doubt is basically what's going to cause you not to receive that which God has got for you. So eradicate doubt of your life. Believe that God exists and that He's real. And when you do that, you'll see the hand of God move. And then, <coughs> excuse me, the, the second last one, I think, yeah, second last one. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now that sounds not good. Okay, so, so be happy when things happen to you. When trial happens to you, be happy. <laughs> okay, that's what James is saying. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You see, <clears throat> that concept of patience, if you look at the fruit of the Spirit, it also talks about long-suffering, if you, if you look at it there. Because patience, long-suffering is sort of like interchangeable. And James encourages us and tells us very clearly that we need to <clears throat> have a stand in God that when things happen to us, when the trials come, when, this, when things attack us and come against our lives, when circumstances become very rough, that in that situation, we count it all joy. So in other words, you can only be joyful if you know why you're joyful and what's coming. So we are joyful because we know that our faith is being tested, but there's victory on the other side. Because it's going to develop patience. Again, as patience, you see that particular passage, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And then it says, but that patience have its perfect work. So as that trial comes, as that situation happens against you, it's building patience in you, knowing that, Lord, you're not going to drop me. You're not going to let me down. You're not going to forsake me. You're gonna, you've never seen the righteous second on this heap being bread. So therefore, I can stand confidently trusting you. My patience is in you. My confidence is in you. My trust is in you. And as you stand, that you may be perfected and complete. Now, I think it's James chapter 2, verse 22. I'm not, don't hold me to that reference, but I think it is. It talks about our faith being perfected or completed, all right? And when you allow patience to work out in your life, your faith is actually being completed, it's being perfected, all right, in, in Christ. And therefore, when that happens, you will lack nothing, all right? So there's a growth, there's a development that has to happen in everyone's faith, okay, where our faith grows and we are patient in that process as we allow our faith to build and to grow, because as it does that, there will come the moment that we are, we, we've developed our faith, we come to completeness, and in that moment, that is when we lack nothing, and I will see the fulfillment of God's word in our lives as we trust Him and believe in Him. So, we, a leader has to be patient, he has to be long-suffering, he has to understand, to stand his ground, and to be there, and to be firm, not to just give up the first obstacle that comes along, or the first challenge that he faces, or the first circumstance that is not the way he wants to wants it to be. Because remember, the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. The devil wants to take you out. Okay, And the thing is, because of that, you need to understand that your faith has to be strong enough that you know that God is faithful. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. He will not drop you. And because of that, you can stand your ground. Okay, So we need to understand then that we need to be patient in that process. And not only you are a man of faith, you also, in a woman of faith, you also have to let your pa let patience grow, long suffering grow in your life. Then the last one I'd like to look at before we close off for this particular topic is in Joshua chapter one and verse eight. We also see it in two Peter three verse eighteen, and it reads as follows: "Is the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in a day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous." And then you will have good success. And then 2 Peter 3 verse 18 says, But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, a leader has to be a person of knowledge. Not only academic skill. All right. So in other words, yes, you need to know, if you're an architect, you need to know about buildings. If you're a medical practitioner of some sort, a doctor, nurse, whatever, then you need to understand the medicine and you need to understand the human body. 
um, if you want to go into administration finance, you need to be an accountant. Okay, so there's there's normal knowledge that has to be built up in the individual, in you and I, to be able to be well equipped to be a good leader. All right, so you can't lead if you don't know your field. So if you want to lead an engineering firm, then please at least study some engineering. All right, because otherwise you can they're going to put ears on you because the thing is you, they're going to talk all through your head. So you need to at least try and build that academic knowledge, but not in the case, sorry, in a case of a godly leader, it goes further than that. Because not only do we have to have knowledge and, 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 and expertise in what we do on a secular basis, we also have to know God's word, all right, and understand what he says and promises and tells us. Because the more you know his word, in Joshua 1, 8, it says that knowledge, that meditating on God's word, allowing God's word into your life, becoming more acquainted with God and with his word, you will make your way prosperous because you will get wisdom, you will get knowledge, you'll get understanding. And when that happens, you'll be able to live your life more effectively. And as a leader, you'll be able to fulfill the functions and the call that God has placed upon your life. All right. And then in 2 Peter 3, verse 18, it says, but growing the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus um, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So our knowledge is not only biblical knowledge, understanding what the Bible is saying, it's getting to know our Savior. All right. Getting to know our Messiah. Getting to know our King. All right. And our knowledge of Him is what's really important. Being able to recognize His voice, being obedient to His voice, being able to respond to Him when He talks to you, to be able to live out your life in obedience to Him. So that is what becomes critical in every single one's life and every single one's um, uh, day-to-day living. Because if you and I just try and build up academic knowledge, if you and I just try and build up some kind of experience, and then we add the word to it, and we gain the word, and we do all that. That's all important. But you need to get to know Jesus, all right? So your knowledge needs to go further than just academic or the word of God. It needs to go to the person of Jesus. And as you do that, you become even a more effective leader than than you would have been before. So I've covered a couple of characteristics of a leader tonight. We'll do some more next week, but all on the next topic. But we need to, I want you to understand. I want you to, to, to come to a place that the more of these qualities you can bring into your life, and those that are weak, work on them and build them up. Okay. Allow God through His Holy Spirit to come into your life and to strengthen those areas that are weak. And as you do that, you will become a more effective leader and become a more effective person in your day-to-day life in, in, in doing the things that the Lord wants you to do and fulfilling His call upon your life. And that is really what it's all about. Okay, then it's unlocking your full potential and living out everything that God has purposed and planned for you. And ultimately, we want people to look at us and see Jesus in us. All right, as we lead them and they follow us. So until next time, may the Lord richly bless you.